Good morning. I don't know about you guys, but uh, this has been a phenomenal morning. Everything from just listening to conversations happening before service to just being able to pray together as a family to seeing new faces to being able to sing at the top of our lungs and not have to worry about whether somebody's going to tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, you're off key. This is why I love what we do here, because we genuinely, like, I don't, if, if you've been coming for a while, I hope you have felt this way, and if you're new here, I hope you've felt this way this morning, but, you know, we, we genuinely do. We really see ourselves as a family that loves, about, loves each other and cares about what's happening in, our, in each other's world and, and wants to see each other grow to a point to where we can walk through life together knowing that when we say, hey, I love you that you genuinely know it. And over the last few weeks, we've been dealing, we've been rolling through this series um, called Right Now. Because a lot of times we tend to look at what's happening in our lives right now at this moment in time, and we think one of two ways. You know, for, for example, you know, when we're, when we're growing up and we're, we're in school or college, high school, even when you start a new job, you look ahead down the road and you say, this is where I want to be. And when you find yourself in that place where you want to be, you tend to look out the window and one of two things happens. You're five years down the road into a five-year plan and you look and you take stock and you go, wow, this ain't at all what I thought it was going to be. Or you stop and you look and say, this is, this is better than I thought it was going to be. Either way, what happens in that right now moment can alter the course of what happens over the next couple days, weeks, months, even years. Not just for you, but for the people around you. You know, there are times in our lives where things just kind of happen and we can't figure out why in the what is going on. You know, sometimes it just feels like every day just tends to just kind of spiral out of control. You wake up one morning and you stub your toe on the, on the door frame getting out of bed, or you stumble and fall, you drop your coffee. Or maybe for those of you that are in here that are um, high school students or even college students, maybe, just maybe, you walk out the door and you trip and fall and everything that you've worked so hard on on that project just scatters everywhere. And all 300 pages you wrote for that dissertation are all out of order. And you have no idea what you're going to do next. When it's bad, we feel like it just can't get any worse. But when it's good, we just can't seem to bring ourselves down and humble ourselves to the point to where it's like, okay, when it comes to God using us, we look at those moments and we say, well, everything is just going terrible. There's no way God can use me now. Things are going great, so God is obviously going to use me in a big way. Because we tend to take our circumstances and the things that happen to us on a daily basis or a weekly basis, and we to try to determine our usability based on that, whether or not God can use us. And if you look through Scripture, there's so many people that are like that. We read it and we look at it and we go, well, there's no way God's going to use them, and absolutely God's going to use them, and then things just kind of explode. We looked at the very, very first week of this. If you weren't able to be here, we're just going to kind of recap so that you know what's going on. The first week, we took a look at a passage of Scripture in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 7, okay? And there's two little verses here that just Paul is, is writing. He starts off writing about marriage, and then in the middle of this, he throws this in. He starts talking about if you're able to be free, be free. If you're a slave, try it. Don't, you know, stay where you are. He says this, as you were bought with a price. This is verse 23. You were bought with a price, so do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, whatever condition each of you was called, there let him remain with God. He says, whatever circumstances, whatever condition you find yourself in, he starts and he says, if you were a slave, by all means, stay there. But if you can be free, then get free. If you're free, stay there. He, says, so, he said, don't worry about your circumstance trying to determine whether or not you can do things for God. Stay where you at. As long as you are with God, you're good. Don't try to sidestep it. Stay there. See, we live in a world that says in order to get more and be more, you have to be more. If, you, if, you are, if you're not at the top of your level, if you are not the big dog, you have to go there. The problem is we all can't be there. We can't all be the top dog. We can't all be, I mean, uh, if all of us were the top dog, who would be the ones making the top dog look good? Right? 
We have to live a life based on what God says instead of what our culture says. The first week we said the bottom line was this, God can use you in spite of your circumstances. Whether your circumstances are good or bad is irrelevant to God. He can use you in spite of that. And sometimes he does the, the opposite of what we think he's going to do so that he can bring honor and glory to himself so that it keeps us on our toes a little bit. And in the second week, we talked about the idea that, you know what, we all love stories. We love stories that make us laugh, that make us cry, that make us feel like, oh, get the adrenaline going. That's why we all debate every year on whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not. And we talked about Esther's story. And Esther's story is amazing. It's the, it's the kind of stuff that a Hollywood blockbuster would be made out of. There's so much going on. And what we tend to love about it is the rags to riches aspect. Here you have this poor Hebrew girl who was an orphan being raised by her cousin who ends up becoming the queen of Persia. But then it kind of starts to unfold and unravel and you see all kinds of crazy things going on all the way down to her people almost being eradicated. And in this story, we see Esther as this amazing hero because we see her at the end of the story standing up to the ringleader of all of this and saying, this is not okay. But we, what we forget is that she's exactly like us. We saw in that, in that second week in Esther chapter 4, verse 11, she's gotten this letter from her, her cousin Mordecai saying, go to the king. And she says, whoa, whoa, whoa. All the king's servants and people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there's just one law to be put to death. Except for the one that the king holds his scepter up for. He said, listen, Mordecai, this is, this is a suicide mission you're asking me to take up. And he says, and listen, not just, everybody knows this law, but here's the deal, Mordecai, you don't realize this, but I haven't been called to the king for 30 days. For a month now, he hasn't wanted me in his sight. So, yeah, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Mordecai writes her back and says, you know what, well, that's, that's all well and good, but Esther, have you ever thought about the fact that maybe it's for a time exactly like this that God placed you where you are? For a time just like this, maybe God has put you in this place. And she relents and she goes through and you know, she fell into the same trap that we all do. She wasn't anybody important. She was an orphan. She wasn't someone rich and powerful. And in fact, she was even a foreigner in the land that she was living in. But she, God used her and her cousin to alter the face of history for that area. And we saw in week two that your background doesn't even determine whether or not God can use you. Your current circumstances are irrelevant. Your background is irrelevant. He doesn't care. If he wants to use you, he can use you if we'll allow him. And then last week, we took a look at probably my, one of my favorite Bible characters of all time, a guy named Gideon. And we kind of looked at it from this idea of, you know, all of us at some point in our life have felt unqualified to do something. When I found out I was going to be a father and that I was going to have a daughter, I kind of panicked a little bit because I was like, I have no idea what to do with a little girl. They didn't have a daughter's, uh, a dad's of daughters for dummies, so I didn't know what I was going to do. So I felt completely unqualified, just like most of us. When God says, I want you to do this, or, or your boss at work comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to give you this promotion, we feel completely unqualified, and so we push back against it. And Gideon was no different. We saw in his story as the angel came and said, no, G listen, God is going to use you to save Israel. Gideon ends up making this comment in Judges chapter 6, verse 15. He says, whoa, no, whoa, whoa, whoa please. Just, just back up. Are you kidding me? How can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. He says, listen, you've got the wrong guy because my clan, my tribe is the least. They are the weakest, smallest tribe, and out of that, I'm the smallest there is. You don't need me. You need somebody bigger. You need somebody way more qualified. And in that third week, we realized this, that God is not limited by what we think of ourselves. What we think about ourselves doesn't determine whether or not God can use us. He looks at us and says, I see not what you are, but what you can be. I see something in you that can take and move this thing even further than what you ever thought possible. You see weakness, I see something that will be unbelievable. You know, why do we think God can't use us? 
We see this, and, you know, for the last three weeks we've done this and we've talked about these things, and still this week, some of you, I guarantee you, you kind of felt that little tap that said, hey, I want you to go talk to that person, or I want you to go do this, and I want you to do that. And you said, I don't think so, God. I just, I, I'm not, I just, no, you got the wrong guy. Why do we do that? Why do we take that attitude? Why do we even look at sometimes and say, God says, you know what? I love you more than you could ever imagine. And you look at it and you say, God, you got the wrong guy. There's no way you can love me. It's because we tend to look at our past failures. We look at the things that brought us to the place where we are now. And for some of you, that feels like you are like at the bottom rung. You look, all you can do is look up and see the bottoms of the feet above you. For some of you, you feel like, I no, I can't do that because I've done this and this and this. Or maybe God's asked you to do something and you're a recent believer. Maybe you've not even been a believer for very long. You look at it and say, well, I don't know enough, God. I'm not smart enough. Or maybe, just maybe, the world around you has told you you've got the wrong cultural background or the wrong racial background. Or maybe even the wrong family upbringing. You're not from the right family. You can't do that. You can't have that job. You can't reach that goal. You can't do that because... You're just flat out wrong. I don't mean wrong as in you gave the wrong answers, but wrong as in you are the absolute wrong person. But do you realize that if you feel that way, if you feel like you are the wrong person for God to use and the people around you are saying you are the wrong person for God to use, you are in unbelievable company. Because that one list of things, past failures, recent believers, wrong culture, family upbringing, those things can be applied to so many people in the Bible that God did huge things through. Take Moses, for example. Moses led the largest exodus out of any country known to man at the time, and he was from a different culture than what was there. He even had so many past failures, he had even actually committed murder, and God used him to bring the nation of Israel out of Egypt. What about Jacob? Jacob literally stole a birthright. And then God said, listen, I, <laughs> I'm going to completely change your name, and there's going to be an amazing nation that's going to come out of you, the nation of Israel. What about King David? David was, he became one of the greatest kings Israel had ever known, ended up having the, the Messiah born through his bloodline. And he was just a teenage shepherd when he was selected to be the king. But there's one person in particular that if we really think about it, we would have really balked at if God had told us, I'm going to use that person. Because let's be honest. We can be the most open-minded person in the world. But there are people that when we look at them, we go, there's no way that God could use them. We come in contact with them every single day. But let me set the stage for you, okay? Israel has left Egypt. They've wandered around the desert. Moses has died, and now Joshua has taken up the mantle of leadership for the nation. And they're getting ready to go into the area that God has promised them. They're getting ready to cross into Canaan and start. God's, God has literally told them, go in, and everything that's before you I'm going to give you. If you come up against a nation, level it. Don't leave anything alive because it's yours now. So they're sitting there. They come up and they see this place and Joshua takes and he says, I'm going to send a couple of you guys out. I want you to go across and I want you to spy specifically in Jericho and see what we're up against and then come back. And this is kind of where we pick this up and where we're introduced to this person. If you have a Bible, I want you to go ahead and pull it out and open up to the book of Joshua. We're going to be in chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay. You can follow along on the screens, or if you have the YouVersion app, you can open it up. You'll see us in the, uh, in the events tab in there, and you can follow along from there. Okay, but we're going to be in Joshua chapter 2, and there's literally just one passage of Scripture here, okay? Okay, so we've already seen this. Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men. Why just two? Well, because if you send a whole bunch in, they're going to be pretty easy to spot because they're not from around here. So he sends two spies, and they go, and he goes and he says, go and view the land, 
especially Jericho. They go in, they get noticed, they get caught, they, they're seen coming in. And then you see this, this weird thing happen. It says, they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Okay? Now, these guys are sitting there. They are locked away in this place. They're in this prostitute's house. Now, the word that's used there can mean a, a, a myriad of different things, but most theologians have come across and said, and it's exactly what we think it is. Okay, this is, a, this is a young lady who made her living. Yeah. And so they're in this house, which for us, we go, well, why did they go there in the first place? Well, think about it. This would have been a common thing for outsiders and people from other cities to have come and gone to a prostitute's house because there's lots of people there. It's a gathering place. It would have been a great place strategically for them to learn as much as they needed to about the town and the city they, they were trying to get information about. They're there, and all of a sudden the king sends people and says, it goes to Rahab and says, listen, we have found out that there are two spies that have come into our city and that they're here. And Rahab looks at the king and says, no, they were here, but they're gone. They left. I don't know where they went to. And the entire time, she has them hiding up on the roof. And when they come down, they look at her, and, the, and it's kind of, well, what in the world happened there? And she said, listen, your reputation precedes you. I know who your God is. His reputation has spread. We know about Egypt we know what's happened. We know what's gone on. So here's what I'm asking of you. And basically this, if, I, if you're here, that means something bad is going to happen to us. So here's what I, just please, spare my family and myself. And they'll never know you were here. They'll never know that you guys were here. I said, okay. If you will do this, we will make sure that you're spared. Should they tell her, said, hang a, a scarlet thread out of your window, and everyone will know that you are to be left alone because of you, we've been saved. And so everything unfolds exactly like that. We look at this, and we see them, and we go, well, wait a minute. So God used Rahab. Yeah. God used Rahab to save and to keep the mission that he had set in front of Joshua and the nation of Israel, to keep it rolling, to keep it going. Because if those two men had been caught, they would have very quickly been executed. But God took Rahab, a prostitute. She lowered, and this is the thing, there's so many things here that for us, we look at and go, what? Like we said, she was a prostitute. Second, she was living in the city that God had already said was going to fall. She was, already, she was a condemned person because God had already said, go to these places, level them, leave nothing standing, leave no one that's alive or anything that's alive, alive. She was from a culture that didn't believe that God was God. She was Canaanite. They were very polytheistic, meaning they had multiple gods. Their religious system wasn't one that just said, okay, you are God. It was your God and 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 I'm a God and you're a God. We're all a God. She was what in our culture, in our church culture, we would say, well, she's just so far away from God. She needs Jesus. Yes. But can I just tell you this? I want to break a thought process this morning. I want to break something that has become so ingrained in us as Christians and as a, as a culture, and it's this. You don't have to be perfect for God to use you. You don't have to be perfect for God to use you. You just have to be willing. I've had people over and over and over look at me and say, well, you know, I've got this and this in my past, and, you know, I feel like 
Like, I feel like you're, you're telling me about God and it sounds great, but I just, I need to, I need to get this straight first. No. Why in the world, if you were sick, would you wait to get well before you went to a doctor? You wouldn't. It's ridiculous. So why in the world, if you hear the message of Jesus and you hear, yeah, oh my goodness, he's exactly, I believe he is exactly, but I'm not going to give my life to him until I get straightened out. I'm not going to allow myself to be used by him until I'm straightened out. That doesn't make any sense. Moses was messed up. Moses was imperfect. And God used him. David was a liar and a murderer and an adulterer, and God used him. Rahab was a prostitute. She didn't look at them and, and say, okay, well, I feel like I'm supposed to hide you guys, but I'm just not part of, I don't, I don't see things the way that you do, so I'm just going to kind of step back and let them take you. No. She saw what needed to be done and saw that God was exactly who God says he is and decided he, she needed to act. When was the last time that you found yourself in a situation that you knew you were supposed to do something, but you looked at the mistake that you made 10 minutes earlier and said, oh, that mistake is way too big for God to, to use me now. You don't have to be perfect for God to use you. If God wants to use you, there is no mistake big enough that he can't push past to use you. The Bible says the only mistake that you can make that can separate you from God is denying that he is who he says he is and choosing to stay away from it. That's it. Anything else, God has the ability to forgive and move on from and use you in spite of. You know what the crazy thing about Rahab is? We look at it and say, well, that's, that's fine. You know, she, she did that. She saved them. She hid them, whatever. That's, you know, okay. Well, they took the city. Big deal. What was her payoff? Well, one, her entire family was spared. When, they even, when the walls fell and Joshua sent everybody in, he said, okay, listen, everybody go in. We're going to do exactly what God says, but leave Rahab and her family alone. God honored her willingness to be used and spared her family. They've actually found the remains of Jericho. They've actually done archaeological digs, okay? And they found this. And the Bible says that, that Rahab's house was built into the wall, okay? There's one building that is still standing that is built into the wall that they have unearthed in Jericho. They have no way of proving that it's Rahab's house. But there's a pretty good argument for it. Ray, God didn't just spare her family, but if you look in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, there's this big monstrous lineage of Jesus. Okay? Matthew and Luke both give genealogies of Jesus. In the book of Matthew, there's a few different people that are mentioned, and here's one in verse 5. It says this, going there, it says, And Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, a prostitute, became part of the direct lineage of the Savior of the world. How crazy is that? And we look in the mirror and say, it can't be done. It can't be done. <laughs> God took someone who wasn't even an Israelite and saved an entire nation. The entire nation of Israel. And then used them to eventually bring the Savior of the world into existence. There's a little word that we like to use in the Christian world. 
and it's the word grace. We are real good about extending it a lot of times to other people. Grace just at its simplest form means that you don't get what you do deserve. At its simplest terms. We're real good about looking at people and saying, you know what? I'm just going to give them a little bit of grace there because they probably just didn't know what they were doing. But yet when it comes to believing that God can extend grace to us, we overlook it. The entire reason that we're here today is because God gave us something we didn't deserve. None of us were worthy of being used by God. None of us were even worthy of even having a relationship with God. But the Bible says that while we were still sinners, while we were still messing up, while we were still making mistakes, while we were still imperfect, Christ died for us. That is a perfect picture of grace. The Bible says that it's by grace through faith that we're saved. Otherwise, anybody could boast about it. God doesn't use us because he has to. He uses us because he wants to. And it doesn't matter what your current circumstances are. It doesn't matter what your past background is. It doesn't matter what your failures are. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. He shows us grace and says, I choose to use you anyway. And if we will get out of our own way and let God use us the way that only he can, you would be amazed at what could happen. I want to ask you a question this morning as we kind of wrap up. What is it right now that is keeping you from letting God work through you. When I say work through you, I'm not talking about, okay, you're going to be a missionary. I'm talking about what is it about you right now that is keeping you from being that person that just says hi to somebody? What is it about you that is keeping you from being that person that says, you know what, I'd be willing to help take up an offering from time to time. What is it about you that says, well, I'm just, I'm just, I'm not good enough. What is it that's keeping you from being that person that God is saying he wants to use. Because every single one of us has that one thing. So for you, what is it? Because I, I, whatever it is, I can tell you this. It pales in comparison to the grace that God has already showed you. It's time to take off the handcuffs that you have put on yourself. And let God use you the way that he wants to. Because you'll never deserve it. You'll never be able to earn it. You'll never look at the mirror and say, I finally arrived. I'm finally good enough. But you can look in the mirror and say, by God's grace, today I'm going to be used. By God's grace, today I'm going to love somebody that was hard to love yesterday. By God's grace, I'm going to forgive somebody that needs my forgiveness. By God's grace, I'm going to say hello to someone who's having a rough day. And I promise you it will change the world for that person. God has placed us where we are right now so that we can be his hands and his feet if we'll let him. Father, thank you. for loving us in spite of ourselves and for always seeing what we can be instead of what we are right now. I pray this morning as we just stop and we sing, as we reflect, I pray that you will remind us of just how much grace you've already given us. Father, I pray that you'll help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. That you'll help us see past our imperfections and our brokenness.
and show us how amazing the world can be if we'll just let you work. God, thank you for people like Rahab and Gideon and Esther. People that we can learn from. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.